Hi everyone! It's hard to believe, but we're at Lesson 170, which is the end of yet another section. There is no cruelty in God and none in me. This should be good news since we all think we've done some awful things. So no one attacks without the intent to hurt. This can have no exception. When you think that you attack in self-defense, what you really mean is that to be cruel is protection. You're safe because of cruelty. You mean that you believe to hurt another brings you freedom. And you mean that to attack is to exchange the state in which you now are for something better, safer, more secure from dangerous invasion and from fear. Good thing to be paying attention to these days, not only for ourselves, but in a much broader sense. So how thoroughly insane is the idea that to defend from fear is to attack? For here is fear begotten and fed with blood to make it grow and swell and rage. And thus, with defenses is fear protected, not escaped ever. So today we learn a lesson that can save you more delay and needless misery than you can possibly imagine, and it's this. You make what you defend against by projection, and by your defense against it, it seems real and inescapable and in your face, and you're just stuck with it. So lay down your arms, and only then do you perceive it false. Only then do you actually realize you're safe. So it seems like it's the enemy without that you attack. Yet your defense sets up an enemy within, an alien thought at war with you, depriving you of peace, splitting your mind into two camps which seem wholly irreconcilable. For love, which is what you of course actually are, now has an enemy, an opposite, and fear, the alien, now needs your defense against the threat of what you really are. Now, if you consider carefully the means by which your fancied self-defense proceeds on its imagined way, you will perceive the premises on which the idea stands. Okay, first, it would be obvious that ideas would have to leave their source because it is you who make attack and must have first conceived of it. Yet you attack outside yourself and separate your mind from him who is to be attacked with perfect faith that the split you made is real. Everything's going on in your own mind, although it appears to be out in the physical world. Next are the attributes of love bestowed upon the enemy. For fear now becomes your safety and protector of your peace, along with all that cruelty and defensiveness. And this is what you turn to for solace and escape from doubts about your strength and hope of rest in dreamless quiet. And as love is shorn of what belongs to it and it alone, that's where the power, the glory, the safety lies, then love is endowed with the attributes of fear. Because love would just ask you to lay down all defense as merely foolish, and your arms indeed would crumble into dust, for such they are. That's how effective they are as a pile of dust. So now, with love as the enemy, cruelty becomes a god, and gods demand that those who worship them obey their dictates and refuse to question them. Harsh punishment is meted out relentlessly to those who ask if the demands are sensible or even sane. Like, do all these defenses make sense? It is their enemies who are unreasonable and insane, while they are always merciful and just and righteous and good. So today we're going to look upon this cruel God dispassionately. And we note that though his lips are smeared with blood and fire seems to flame from him, he is made of stone. He can do nothing. He has no real substance. We don't need to defy his power. He doesn't have any. 
and those who see in him their safety have no guardian, no strength to call upon in danger, and no mighty warrior to fight for them. As always, you can see, we have everything upside down and backwards. <laughs> this moment of discovery can be terrible. But it can also be the time of your release from abject slavery to fear and cruelty and defensiveness and the other one is the enemy. You make a choice, standing before this idol, seeing him exactly as he is. Will you restore to love what you have sought to wrest from him and lay before this mindless piece of stone that would be power, might, and glory. That's what we now think about our defenses and put that where it belongs to love instead? Or will you just make another idol to replace it? For the God of cruelty takes many forms. Another can always be found. Yet do not think that fear is the escape from fear. Let's remember what the text has stressed about the obstacles to peace, the final one, the hardest to believe is nothing, and a seeming obstacle with the appearance of a solid, impenetrable block, fearful and beyond surmounting, is the fear of God himself, the fear of love. Here is the basic premise that enthrones the thought of fear as God. For fear is loved by those who worship it, and love appears to be invested now with cruelty. Where does this totally insane belief in the gods of vengeance come from? Love has not confused its attributes with those of fear, yet must the worshipers of fear perceive their own confusion in fear's enemy. Its cruelty is now a part of love, and what becomes more fearful, therefore, than the heart of love itself? The blood appears to be upon his lips. The fire comes from him, and he is terrible above all else, cruel beyond conception, striking down all who acknowledge him to be their God. And you know what? It's really frightful when you think of the number of people who believe this about God, which is really only love. The choice you make today is certain, for you look for the last time upon this bit of carven stone you made and call it God no longer. You have reached this place before, but you've chosen that this cruel God remain with you in still another form. And so the fear of God returned with you. This time, leave it there. And you can return to a new world, unburdened by its weight. And this new world is not beheld in the sightless, fear-driven eyes, but in the vision that your choice for love has restored to you. Now do your eyes belong to Christ, and he looks through them. Now your voice belongs to God and echoes his, and now your heart remains at peace forever. Finally you are safe. Finally you understand. You have chosen him in place of idols, and your attributes given by your creator are restored to you at last. It's not like they disappeared, but they disappeared from your awareness. The call for God is heard. The call for love is heard and answered. Now fear has made way for love as God himself replaces cruelty. Father, we are like you. No cruelty abides in us, for there is none in you. Your peace is ours, and we bless the world with what we have received from you alone. We choose again, and we make our choice for all our brothers, knowing they are one with us. We bring them your salvation as we have received it now, and we give thanks for them who render us complete. We give thanks for our actual true oneness. In them we see your glory, and in them we find our peace. Holy are we because your holiness has set us free. 
and we give thanks. Amen. And I surely give thanks that you're here, that you're doing what you're doing, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye.